And so the reason I want to kind of talk about what is clean steel, or, or my preference actually is steel cleanliness in general, is because it means different things to different people. And if you're really familiar with a lot of the literature on steel cleanliness, the magic numbers everybody uses to define something clean, well, certainly from about the 30s to today have drastically changed. And so in some operations, there can be low or no macro inclusions. And even that can mean two different cutoffs, at least about today. Some people use 20 microns and larger as a macro inclusion. Some people use anything from 10 microns and larger. Some people use much larger values, uh, to be honest. And that's often dependent upon the size of the product they make. If you make something with 8-inch section thicknesses, you're going to be able to live with larger macro inclusions and even larger micro inclusions. So the definitions tend to shift. So anything below the cutoff for a macro is defined often as a micro inclusion. And if you take some inspiration uh, from uh, maybe some of our investment, high volume investment casting people, and certainly the raw steel industry is pushing for no inclusions above one micron. Uh, I don't think anybody's really achieved that yet. But again, the thing I kind of want to talk about is when we, we are defining our steel cleanliness, one of the things we have to figure out what values we're going to use to cut off for macro inclusions, micro inclusions, you know, what are, what are the most detrimental inclusions for the casting for producing? And that's not always an easy answer, I understand that. And so some of that has to be driven by customer conversations. And certainly, the other thing is, they're going to get smaller with time. You know, in the next decade, we'll probably lower some of these values again. Uh, certainly in the next 20 years, I think you'll see that. <clears throat> and so my my reason for not calling it clean steel too much, and you'll hear me talk about steel cleanliness more as the term I prefer, is because I look at it as a continuum of criteria and approaches. And so the reason that you want to improve steel cleanliness is often related to improving strength, but particularly uh, I know of foundries that struggle with elongations and sharpie impact requirements, and that's one place that often is, is a culprit for low values, especially on sharpies. I have, I've interacted with a few foundries where their customers are, are increasing the impact values they need. That's usually where they're struggling the most is, is their cleanliness. Sometimes if you machine your own material, you you notice if you have cleaner batches of castings that you have longer cutting to a life, which can impact your bottom line or the customers. Uh, you can reduce quote unquote upgrading, where you know as many people are familiar, you find an inclusion either uh, maybe it's very large that you detect it on X-ray or you have an indication in UT and you gouge it out and you weld it, how do you, or, or quote unquote upgrading the casting, so, you know, that adds a lot of cost to the operation. And so we want to reduce that. Uh, hydrogen embrailment if for your product, that's a problem. And you want to ensure that you're not going to have those kind of issues. And the inclusions have been found to be hydrogen traps where hydrogen tends to stay and be a reservoir for uh, enhancing in hydrogen embrittlement, so that can be a problem. And I guess one of the biggest ones is usually it helps lead to happy customers. So in terms of methodologies, again, if you've, you've been around the industry a while, talk to fellow foundrymen, if you're new and you start kind of reading some of the open literature that's out there uh, from the various journals, and and uh, AFS does a very good job of helping make some of that available. You start realizing that, A, we've tried different approaches, and B, some of those tend to be over the years things we continually look at. You know, gating system, gating design, uh, reducing turbulence in the gating, or keeping flow velocities down. Uh, some work's been done on changing how you do the pouring system, integrating the uh, ladle shroud with the down sprue and several articles about Harrison's field castings approach uh, that have been in a modern casting. 
I think some of the newer things have been some melting technologies where people are looking at bubbling argon up through the bottom of their induction furnace through a porous plug <coughs> during melting and, and maybe during holding uh, or holding a little longer to, to help remove the inclusions and float them out. Some people have uh, experimented with uh, dripping liquid argon or, or pour, having argon flow into their melting furnace to reduce oxidation by displacing the oxygen. Uh, argon oxygen decarburization after melting has been a proven technology for decades for reducing inclusions, both in the foundries and the, and the rod in mill industry. There's also continuing use of filters to filtrate out, uh, looking at improved refractories, and then things that are more related sort of the melting practice. Uh, specifically, are certain deoxidation practices better than others? What's our blowing practice versus the best kinds of blowing practice? Uh, do we have the best mold materials? Do we have weak mold strengths? Uh, is that causing some of our issues? Should we go to tile gating to reduce some of that. So those sort of things we still talk about today as an industry and we've been talking about for a while. And some of these are much more expensive to implement than others. And some of the less expensive approaches may be more difficult to get operating personnel to adopt and understand why they need to do it. So I'd like to do a poll on maybe which of these have, have you considered. And if Shannon, if you had gotten any questions yet, I can try to answer them. We do have one question about if we're going to get the PowerPoint presentation after the webinar. Um, we'll be you'll be getting an email of the uh, recording and um, uh, I think that it would be fine to provide the PowerPoint as well. Um, oh, I, I don't know I, if, if you have an opinion. I, I'm fine with providing the PowerPoint. I think the recording may be more useful, but I I can make sure I get you my slides, uh, Shannon, Sounds and good. Can send them out to everybody. Will do. That I think is perfectly fair. I'll give it a few more seconds of the poll. Dr. Tuttle, can you see the results on your end? Um, not really. OK, it looks like we've got 76% said gating design, about 11% AOD, 50% air bubble, AR bubble cover, 68% melting practice change, and 11% are not sure. Well, hopefully we can help people with the not sure, at least find, uh, think about which technologies. Well, that helps me a little bit. That's a little, a little different than I had my preconceived notion uh, on. Do I have control back? Yeah, you're, you're on screen. OK. All right, well, you know, like I said, the, the results are a little different than I had, uh, I had thought. I know there's been a lot of talk of the bubbling argon. Um, I, I would say probably my guess from often, and this was some of my motivation to give this talk, is I think a lot of times we're not uh, in the steel casting doing enough to look at our gating and, and optimizing those designs. Um, and I'm not sure. In a, in a, particular founders cases, what their, their thoughts on, whether they go ahead and modify the gating and, and meet the cost themselves since it will improve your scrap rate. Uh, some foundries require their customers to do it. I can tell you if you're having a high scrap rate uh, due to inclusions and you, you eventually come to the conclusion that, that it's because of gating, it may just be in your interest to, to go ahead and modify the pattern and, and look at the return on investment. I know that's sometimes a, a roadblock. And hopefully, since a lot of others, the rest was another uh, set of selections on 
melting related. Hopefully this will help you understand whether you really have a melting problem or, or maybe a gating and pouring. So that does help me a little bit, quite a bit. Okay, and so maybe, and I, if I remember the numbers right, you know, the way the splits are, there's some people split between maybe it was a gating or, or melting. And that, that's part of the reason for this presentation is it's been really difficult for us as an industry to kind of choose a strategy. And if you talk to different foundries, uh, particularly maybe after some of the meetings in, uh, or during social hours, you'll hear some people say they have real success with, with this. I, I actually know of cases of people who've installed the argon bubbling and, and it didn't solve their problem. And so they went through a capital expense because other foundries were successful and, and they weren't. And, and I have my suspicions of why that is, and it's basically because that wasn't, melting wasn't their problem. Uh, and so how do you decide what methods to implement? How do you decide gaining approaches versus melting approaches? And sometimes we have customers, and this is where you know, I, I've heard some of the argon stuff because of some of the customers out there some, especially some of the more sophisticated think that that's the silver bullet. And I know for our individual foundries, you know, we need to understand what our, our major driver is and get the biggest return on investment. How do we implement limited resources to make the biggest impact for our operation? Or the question that, that it, the way it's usually phrased is what's best for my foundry? And that's what I want to choose, focus on today. It's really what's right for your foundry. How do you to this? How do you decide that? And so the presentation is not so much on on specific technologies, but how do you decide where your problem in your process is? And you really need process data to derive that decision. And as I mentioned before, the part of the reason that you see all these different approaches is because really it's a continuum of approaches. There are low hanging fruits, and, and in terms of getting your steel cleanliness to improve. And as you get a good handle on those, you start maybe looking at or are driven by customer requirements to even higher levels of cleanliness. And it may depend upon your product methods. Some of you will, I know, need very clean metal. And some of you can, you know, your customers don't expect as much. But you want to make sure you don't have to do as much upgrading or that welding. How do you approach that? And so that's more the focus. Oops, I think. I think I put that in the wrong place. Yeah, I moved that around. All right, just remind me, Shannon, after this, <laughs> this poll a little, to do the next poll after this one, uh, this okay. slide. All right, so some of the ways people have measured their cleanliness to look at their process has been, well, how much time do we spend on our average casting? Or if you're a your produ large production shop, maybe there's certain uh, part numbers you're looking at. How much average on average welding rod do we consume? If you're machining internally, how much tool wear or the, maybe the number of parts per insert? Uh, I know for quite a few places are use the either the number of inclusions or the area of inclusions on the surface of their castings. Uh, some people actually section castings, take a couple out of production and start cutting them up. Uh, and I'm not sure there's there's too many with the melt sampling throughout the process, uh, but there are I think a couple people who try to do that. And, and the worst, uh, I guess I'm leading my opinion, the worst one's customer complaints of, hey, they're dirty. And so there's various different ones that are used. And so, Shannon, if you could give me that other poll on, I think it should be which, which of these methods people tend to use. It should be the next one. If people could give me some feedback, I'd appreciate that. And if, I don't know, did anybody have another question suddenly? Let me look. One person asked uh, Dr. Tuttle, can you elaborate on process data to track, unless you're planning to address later on in the presentation? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, you know, probably now the person realizes since I just said that. But yeah, that's, what I'm going to talk about is my, 
what I think is a better way to collect that quote unquote process data. Uh, some of it's just the process data you naturally collect you can use, but you need to couple that with where the inclusions are formed to drive decisions again. Is it melting? Is it gating? Do we do we need to make some, some are are we noticing that if we run into certain parameters, our inclusion content's lower than others? And so some of that's process data you already have, like you know, uh, how long it takes you, how long if you're in an arc furnace, you blow what your blowing temperature is, maybe your tap to tap time, no matter which furnace you have. If you're running flag compositions, uh, some of that, but the, the, you got to relate it back to the inclusions, and that's that's going to be what I spend uh, in a few minutes focusing a lot more on. So hopefully that answers that for that person. Okay, and the, the results of the poll are showing that 35% measure welding time or rod consumed, 0% machining tool wear or parts per insert. 29% number per area of inclusions or surface defects, uh, and 35% are saying they section the castings. 0% do melt sampling throughout process. So it looks like about a third of everyone either measures welding time or rod consumed, the, the number of inclusions, or the section castings. Okay. That's a pretty even split. That's about actually where I thought everything would fall. Uh, okay. So I guess I'll comment a little bit. I, you know, a method I, I actually want to advocate more is actually sampling the melt. And for, there's a couple different reasons. And, and part of it's a lot of times the way we find out for like weld rod, uh, often what you're finding is something that's large enough uh, that it shows up on x-ray or it's just a surface defect. And the same issue then, if it's just a surface defect and we're making it look good for the customer, comes up if you're just looking at the number of inclusions or area of inclusions on the surface. And, and that is, you're only looking at the surface, you're not looking throughout the casting. Now, if you section casting, so about you know, you know, kind of a third of you are sectioning the casting, and so you look at inclusions throughout the casting, and it's good. But the problem with all with that method, and and it's also true of the weld rod or uh, surface area uh, defects approach, is that all of those measurements are at the end of our process, and we start guessing what could be causing that. And, you know, we, we do a fairly good job, but I think to really help move our steel cleanliness to the next level as an industry, we've got to figure out a way to understand when inclusions are formed at different points in the process. Because sometimes it's very hard to determine if a macro inclusion is uh, created way back in the furnace, maybe it's flag carryover. Was it formed during pouring and gating? And so what I like about melt sampling is that you get samples during the process and can identify where your inclusions are forming. And when I present the case study, I think I'll make a pretty good case. The other is I know that there's there's a lot of people who don't like sectioning castings, especially the small jobbing foundries, because they, they may make five of the parts, and they don't make, they, they really hurts their profit margin to make extra. And so they're really hesitant to doing that. And even if you can make quite a few, sometimes people are hesitant for sectioning because they go, well, you know, it takes so long, you got to cut a lot just to get to a, to a part that you can, you can mount and polish. And you know, that takes a lot of time, whereas the melt sampling I'm going to kind of talk about an advantage of it is if you do it uh, correctly, you don't have as much bandsaw time. Hopefully I can win you guys over. Uh, but those are some of the disadvantages of techniques. And, and to be honest, you know, that's what our industry has been doing for a long time are those techniques. 
I think the reason that we're not getting more improvements in melt cleanliness is actually related to our measurement system. So I'm a, I'm a big advocate of sampling through the mountain. It's actually because of a project I did uh, several years ago. And I think it's the best way to get an understanding of when you're forming inclusions, how they're changing during your process, and allow you to understand that and understand the formation. They're often also, if you design these sampler, sampling correctly, uh, easier for you to cut up to, to look at inclusions, particularly the, the ones you have to see in the microscope. And if you're a jobbing foundry, it's a little odd easier to create a routine sample that, you, that isn't maybe a huge function of, well, we, we pour enough of these castings, we can, we can sacrifice one. Or maybe that you don't want to ever sacrifice one. And this approach helps you alleviate those, those issues. And like I said, uh, well, not well, like I said. Sometimes people say, but that, that seems difficult. How do you to grab a sample? And really, we actually kind of have the technology and just have to think a little creatively. And it can be as simple as you, you use a small hand ladle, and, and a lot of times people are using a small hand ladle to ladle out a, bit, a little bit of metal to run a spectrometer sample anyways. Or maybe you're using a lollipop sampler to suck up metal for that. And so what you can do is literally pour a, a little, small little circular casting with a hand ladle. You have to make sure that you're not picking up too much of the slag to, when you do that. And you don't want to splash too much to generate a bunch more inclusions and therefore can contaminate the sample you're making. But you can do something as simple as that, and that's a lot less processing effort than inside the lab. You can also use, if you're not familiar, there are in-stream samplers, usually for Jomini bars, that you can buy, where you can, during tap, stick them in and uh, stick in the spout that you see right here uh, into the stream and collect some as you're tapping. And that's a lot easier than section and casting. And now you've got a, uh, I'm trying to remember, about an inch in diameter, I think four inches long piece is a lot very easy to just kind of go over in the metallography lab and cut out a metallographic sample. Uh, or sometimes if things are really bad, you just look at the surface of it. You can also um, just remove a portion of the gating to get a sample if you don't want to sacrifice castings. Uh, I do prefer you know, sectioning a casting if you're a high enough volume operation that you feel comfortable. I do like getting from inside the casting if I can, simply because it gives you an actual measurement of what ended up in the part. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that or you're low volume, and you remove a portion of the gating. Uh, you'll hear me kind of emphasize the low volume. I actually interact with, with quite a few jobbing foundries. Uh, there's only one that I say would say is a high volume foundry in my area. So most of the people I interact with, these are some of the things that they have uh, talked about with me. But really, you just have to think about is really any method that can translate into obtaining a small amount of metal from different points in the process. You do have to do it regularly. Um, I you know, kind of don't care if you do it every heat, uh, shift, daily, weekly, maybe a little longer than I'd want to, but you should do it regularly. And uh, back to that question, so then when you take these samples, you can help correlate with that information of when you took the sample to what your tap temperatures were, your pouring temperatures, which alloy was running, so maybe you identify certain alloys really are uh, more troublesome than others. Maybe you identify, I uh, had an issue with a, that a foundry had discovered that a certain scrap that was much cheaper, but they, they tended to have more inclusion problems. So you can relate that back to data you already record. You don't have to quite yet maybe start recording a boatload of additional data. Just start out relating the data you already collect naturally in your process. Uh, samples can be analyzed a couple different ways. Again, you can use a camera or x-ray to get the really large defects, stuff that we're usually catching on uh, upgrading, looking at weld rod. 
optical microscopy is probably, if I'm guessing, the people sectioning castings pretty regularly. Uh, that's probably I'm, might be part of what they're doing. But if you're going to start seeing some of these below obvious uh, at you know eyesight inclusions that are still sometimes a problem, you're going to have to polish and look at the inclusion. Um, just a reminder, if you're not, if you've never done that, something to be aware of is you don't actually want to etch the samples, uh, especially if you're using image analysis. Uh, the inclusions luckily appear pretty dark, and steel is brilliantly mirror-like, and so that gives a really nice contrast for an image analysis system, which can simplify things for you. There's, of course, uh, as, as PhDs or academics, you guys sometimes talk about, we have all the fancy tools. Um, you've probably heard of scanning electron microscopes with energy dispersive spectrometers. And so both the SEM and the optical, you can size the inclusion. You can if, if also, with the software on some of the systems, uh, run uh, distributions of the different sizes. And so you can get an idea of the number and sizing. And that's also true of the SEM. But if it has an energy dispersive spectrometer or a wavelength dispersive spectrometer, the, the nice additional feature you get is some chemical information. And sometimes you have to combine the morphology or the size of the inclusion with its composition to help you identify where it is. And I'm sure some have actually done that. Uh, before, especially when you're usually when you're really struggling. Uh, another thing that's kind of come out on the market, and there's a, you know, there are a couple different systems, but what are called automated SEM EDS systems. And the one of the drawbacks of the SEM is you do need a pretty qualified operator to run the SEM, and, and they're usually fairly expensive, and uh, you only want to view a few inclusions. Automated SEM systems get around this because you can put a sample in and set up some parameters where you can scan an entire sample on a ten. You can literally put the sample in overnight and run it. Uh, or you can, some of the dedicated units, you can load them 10, I think it's like 10 samples, and it'll just run all of those until they're done. And you can get thousands of inclusions. And the really nice thing about that is you get a combination of both sizing information, composition, but it'll plot it out into typically a ternary plot of, of a set of oxides that you pick as your ternary phase diagram. And it'll show you where the inclusions are clustering composition-wise, but it'll also color the dots it puts on that to give you an idea of what size range or what compositions. So that's a really nice tool. And I'm going to actually put a uh, blurb, and, and hopefully everybody will enjoy today and maybe join us on Tuesday, October 21st at 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time. We have a steel division sponsoring a talk related to these automated SEMs and the kind of information you can get out of them and their application. So I'd really encourage you to, to at least look at that to get an idea of what else is out there. So I think this luckily might be for the you guys the, the last poll, but um, you know, Shannon, if you give the one on uh, which methods for analyzing the particles, or analyzing the inclusions, I'd appreciate it. And did you get any other questions while I was rambling on? Let me check here for you. We have one. What is your opinion of high-end optical emission spectrometers to analyze inclusion and inclusion and metal cleanliness? Boy, you asked a loaded question. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, okay, I'll start my answer this way. Um, I am very aware of that practice. And it has been typically more common in the uh, steel industry, you know, all the raw mills, people who make it the wrong size and smash it. Uh, they have used it 
fairly successfully. The issue I'm aware of is that there are no calibration, real calibration standards generally available in a like a NIST traceable way to calibrate those. My understanding is that's still sometimes a problem. Um, I don't know if I'd shy away from it because the advantage of that, for those of you who don't know it, sorry, I guess I should back up that. For those of you who are like, what the heck is he talking about? Basically, uh, these units are are not your benchtop optical emission, or I still call them spark spectrometers, uh, that we use for doing composition. I mean, they're the larger, you know, very lab scale part per million units that uh, take up part of a room. That, that's the unit we're kind of talking about. Many of those can have as an additional package a set of routines that allows them during the sparking of the sample to detect an inclusion. And basically, let's take an aluminum inclusion, alumina inclusion, and the way that kind of work is if, an, if the arc on the spark spectrometer is striking an inclusion and during its burn, especially the initial stages when it's just starting to burn away material, the spectrometer will look at the aluminum spectral line and you'll see this giant jump. But it will continue to monitor that spectral line during the burn and when it drops back down because essentially you've burned away that, that inclusion you've observed, you'll see the aluminum spectral line intensity decrease to back to what would be the aluminum content of the actual steel because now you're, you're burning it. And so basically it looks at those differences. And there's a lot more science detail, but that's, that's the quick. And so the system is specifically set up to look at that. Um, if your inclusions tend to be, and probably for most of you, the same compositions, then you could probably use that technique. Uh, like I said, the, the issue is how do you calibrate, how intense does the aluminum intensity peak have to reach for you to say, yes, there's an inclusion. And no one's come up with a way to have um, uh, certified reference material. This is that the, a CRM is the material you use when, during standardizing the spectrometer to make sure that it, it's reading the elements uh, intensities correctly and, and knows what 0.1 carbon is, 0.3 carbon, that sort of thing. And there are no real good calibration standards for that. So I know that's one of the issues with technique, especially if you want to make sure you set it up correctly the first time. I know a lot of the mills have spent years looking at samples. The way they set up their systems, they actually do what we're talking about today in melt sampling. Do a boatload of optical images. I mean, the kind level that you're keeping a uh, almost a grad student type person where they're just polishing and, 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 have, and examining samples all the time. They actually compare what they get from that to what those measurements in the high-end optical emission spectrometer are. And uh, that is how they've ended up doing the calibrations. They almost sort of follow a set of samples till they feel confident they've set those program parameters correctly. Uh, and that's the very complicated answer that you ended up, or complicated, yeah, complicated answer you ended up getting. So I hope that was useful to not just the person, but maybe everybody else to be a, a technique. I'm Dr. guessing Sarah, I ran this. Do you have another oh, question? Another you want to sure. want to answer it? If there's any inclusions rating standard to use to measure against against when doing melt sampling, there's not. Um, and I guess I don't. I don't feel bad because what we'll, we'll talk about is usually when you're doing the melt sampling, what you're doing is you're going to end up taking like uh, taking a metallographic sample out of it or a couple, as we'll talk about. And you're going to end up, as long as the calibrations on, say, your optical 
microscope are, are correct so that you know what each pixel is in your camera at that magnification, you can uh, look at it in terms of inclusion size. Uh, so there's not a standard. I'm not sure there's a, that great of a standard related to inclusions at all. Uh, and I think that's primarily because people are, are trying to look at the size of the inclusion. Uh, that may be a good thing. To, uh, that may be a thing we need to do to make life simpler for for not only the industry but our customers is coming up with some sort of standard. So that may be something I, I jot down as as an idea. All right, and then to go over the um, responses to the poll, what method do you use? Uh, Sixty-seven percent said optical. 14% SEM EDS, uh, no one answered automated SEM, and 19% said none. Okay. Well, that helps me out. Um, and so probably, I'm, I'm betting that most people are using optical uh, because they have that available and maybe they don't have an SEM EDS or maybe they only do it when they need to, which is, is fine. I think in some ways it, the question becomes maybe sometimes when you, you're trying to identify, and I probably encourage those people when they're doing optical to once in a while maybe run a sample to, to go, well, the ones that look like this morphology, maybe the rougher looking ones tend to be this composition. and the uh, ones that are more rounded tend to be that composition just to kind of help yourself out and understand. Uh, again, trying to get enough data to make process decisions is really my, my big theme. And, and if you're not familiar with SEM EDS and the sample preparation that goes to it, uh, really we can re use the metal graphic sample you already have uh, to do that. Uh, there's two additional steps to the sample prep, but most of the people who run SEM EDS are used to it. So uh, not like you have to cut a whole separate sample, which is a, maybe something to add. Okay, uh, I should have my next slide back up, and I'm going to actually kind of talk about a, uh, an example of a, a case where I was working with a foundry. Whoops, excuse me. And this is a, a Large foundry defined by the size of their castings. They're small employer. I think they've got uh, 80 people total. Uh, but their castings tend to range between 10 and 30 tons floor weight. And so they, they're, they're this example I use of a job shop. And so it's not uncommon for them to have one part per heat. Uh, I do interact with companies that are, that are smaller, but I worked with them on this. We use a re resin bonded molds or an EAF shop. Uh, running pretty typical acid, silicon manganese, acid practice, silicon manganese block after blow, trimming in the ladle, pretty typical top temperature of 2933. And so we did a project with them where we only looked at that time at uh, the 1050 and the 10585 alloys they were pouring because that tended to be the most popular among the customers they had at that time. And we were collecting their normal process data, their chemistries right from the hair spectrometer, their tap temperatures, blow temperatures, blow times, anything they were regularly recording. Uh, the only other, uh, there were two things we were doing in addition to what they normally did is I was measuring uh, oxygens with a oxygen probe at the end of blowing and at tapping. We also sampled um, the melt by pouring a, from a hand ladle just after blowing and just prior to pouring, and then cut a section of the gating uh, from these castings. They're very large castings, so I actually didn't want a section of casting even if they wanted to. Uh, if you look around your office, it's probably the size of their castings. So it's not something you want to bandsaw at all. So that's cast also. You ended up uh, looking at about 20 heats polished about two samples per location and did optical 
microscopy to look at uh, what inclusions were there, and we're only concerned because of their concerns with any 20 microns and larger. Um, and we, I only grabbed five images per sample. Uh, I was a little younger, less experienced, and uh, didn't have a, a great appreciation of that number should have probably been more like 20 to make sure you're getting good count statistics. Uh, and then we primarily measured the ferrets dimer. That's just the largest. This is the diameter. The system outlines the inclusion and draws the longest line it can, and that's named after the guy who said that that's a way to do it. And that's a pretty common way of doing it in, in, in image analysis. And you can see here are the average chemistries for those heats. We, uh, we only ended up looking at uh, 5, 10, 50 heats. They tend to be a little larger. Most of the heats were the 105.85. We also tried to do a regression analysis in order to determine what was correlated to, in this case, the diameter. And so these equations that you see on the, well, the combination you see on the left side of this table, the first phrase referred to is what we were measuring uh, in terms of an auction blow, so we'd have a slope for it, and then there'd be another slope in this regression analysis for the second factor. And one of the things we found was that there were not too many things correlated in their data with the di average diameter of the inclusions, uh, macro inclusions that were being examined. And the case where we got a reasonable p-value that there was actually a statistical correlation, um, and it wasn't just random uh, chance that we were looking at a relationship. The r-squared value for it was pretty poor, and it said that, uh, you know, in this case, the oxygen at the end of blowing and the oxygen in the ladle just after tap was only about 50 percent correlated with the uh, macro inclusions, we were, average macro inclusion diameter we were seeing. So we're getting some pretty bad correlations. Uh, the next strongest ended up being uh, looking at the number of inclusions, and that ended up being like blow temperature and the oxygen at the end of blowing. Still only about a 70% correlation. It's kind of weak, and it, and it followed some work done in the literature. Know, where they go, well, yeah, higher oxygen levels at the end of the blow tend to form more macro inclusions. Now, that's primarily because you get a lot of oxygen in the mouth, things react, you tend to form a lot of small inclusions. And these inclusions tend to be uh, liquid, and they tend to agglomerate and make the larger macro inclusions. It tends to be the mechanism that, that people talk about. But one of the things that perplexed me when I was going through all the data was that location didn't seem to matter, but it did seem to matter. Uh, there was a hint that there might have been something there, and I ended up plotting things in a box whisker plot. And you can kind of see that the, the, the whiskers overlap, and a, a true statistician will tell you there's no statistical difference. But I found it very interesting that if you look at, at the furnace data, you saw what would be representative of a pretty normal distribution. But at the ladle, the average would go down, and the distribution actually shifted to smaller inclusions. And that made some sense to me, as, as I'll talk about in a little bit. But then we noticed that the gate inside the gating, the average went almost right back identical, but it was also a non-normal distribution. It was actually shifted towards the higher end inclusions and a lot of variation. And so one of the issues, as I hinted at before, is I think a lot of the variation issues are we should have taken more images, because while we think macro inclusions are everywhere, uh, luckily they're, when you're looking through a microscope, they are relatively infrequent. So you do have to take a lot of images to make sure you're capturing them correctly. But the, what I found interesting is the ladle would tend to sit anywhere from two to five minutes before pouring. And that actually would allow for inclusion flotation. And that makes sense of why the size would drop. But then it increased again, almost to like you hadn't done anything. 
um, since it came out of the furnace. And part of that, they use a uh, bottom pour ladle, and with these heat sizes especially, a very turbulent filling because of the metastatic head pressure. And you just hear the air kind of getting pulled into the stream. Really cool looking, but uh, not very good from a cleanliness standpoint. And honestly, because of the size range, they, they do employ the typical, for this size range casting, sort of tiled gating system, but it's not optimized. They didn't tend to use runner extensions, offset pouring basins, uh, very little. The, the gating system sort of just is get the metal into the part. And I think that contributed to, to this variation. And it, if we had sampled only at the end out of the gating, we wouldn't have been able to see this fluctuation in inclusion size and a shift in the distribution. And that kind of gets back to why I advocate this melt sampling of trying to find what's right for my founder. Um, at the time, they were actually thinking of buying an AOD to try to eliminate their inclusion problem. And to be honest, if they had used an AOD with that gating and pouring practice that they had at the time, they probably would have still had the same problems. Might have gotten a little better, but it looks like the issues of pouring and gating are dominating their issues in terms of cleanliness. And so they started focusing and have been and slowly trying to figure out for themselves what things to change in related to that and getting slowly cleaner castings. And again, the idea is getting our best use of limited resources. Um, I know I'm running a little short on time, so I'll kind of skim through. But if you've never seen SEM results, here's SEM results. Uh, we can see the inclusions do dramatically change shape from inside the furnace. Uh, this is just uh, after tapping. You see very uh, liquid inclusions because of round silicon manganese, which is consistent with your silicon manganese block. Just prior to pouring, they shift to uh, an alumina inclusions, which are very solid. But then in the gating, and this is again kind of kind of where sampling throughout. Notice that you know the sizes in the micron bars in these two are not that different than the first one on this slide, and the sizes are, are inching a little up and down you know, along with that data we showed earlier. But we see a very bimodal distribution actually in the gating system very small ones and some large ones. And the compositions are very different. The compositions use much larger ones tend to be lower in aluminum and higher in silicon and manganese, which, probably, you know, which is indicative more of a reoxidation type inclusion. It kind of follows that you have more of a problem in, in pouring and gating. And so hopefully that shows how you can use an SEM to start not only seeing you know, okay, we see size differences and more, you know, shape differences, but we see a chemistry difference that helps you understand what's going on as well. And you wouldn't, again, if you didn't have these images along here, you'd probably see what's in here in the uh, final gating or the final casting and go, well, maybe, maybe our deoxidation isn't as good. Maybe, maybe we're too turbulent in filling the ladle. You, you don't get a good idea unless you look at it along the process. And, and as I mentioned, you know, they were looking at doing a bunch of, they were actually also looking at doing some other melting practice changes. And, and that would involve some capital expenditures when, in fact, they needed to focus on gating and pouring. And that's really why I like the melt sampling technique, is it allows you to get an idea throughout the process with samples that are much easier to cut fairly often for us, what's going on and where are we generating most of those inclusions? If we had seen a picture where we saw the same inclusions and the inclusions maybe decreased from the furnace to the ladle to the casting, then we would know that we do need to go and focus on looking at what parameters do we need to control at the furnace. Do we need to put an AOD in? Do we need argon? All of those other things. But you know, maybe that's not what we need to do uh, if the picture looks different. And that's really why I prefer this style, is it gives you much better information throughout the process to understand where you should be focusing your efforts. And so I know I want to leave some time for questions, so luckily uh, we're at kind of in my presentation. So 
thing I want to also get across is the steel coin lens is a long-term need. We're going to have to follow it, look at this as a long-term view, something we're going to have to continuously measure. Um, and if you're not doing any measurements, you know, it, it gets pretty hard to control it. An old process control axiom of if you're not measuring it, you can't control it. And I think it sounds like everybody here probably agrees with that. And I also like to say that once you improve one area, what you'll start noticing is that then your bottleneck in terms of melt cleanliness shifts around on you. And so we want to have the, the biggest bang for your buck by going to that next bottleneck and that next bottleneck. Kind of like looking at process flow and where where either do we generate scrap or where do we have a bottleneck in, in terms of our capacity. A similar thought uh, should be related to inclusions and melt sampling, I think, is a much better technique for that. So uh, I can take some more questions. And hopefully uh, you found this really helpful. All right, uh, Dr. Tuttle, we do have a, a few more questions, if you don't mind sure. answering. See, the first one says, um, what's the general inclusion level difference uh, induction melting versus arc furnace melting versus ladle furnace. Oh. oh, I don't have numbers, unfortunately. I would say, all right, um, generally because induction furnaces use, we usually use much cleaner scrap in them also typically don't do an oxygen blow. I don't think anybody does. Uh, therefore, you're not re-oxidizing the melt. Um, that probably tends to make better. Uh, they, this foundry also runs some induction uh, melting for some of their, their components. They do see uh, less propensity, uh, although not by much, probably because of the pouring and gating system. Uh, now, LMF, um, you know, just to, to make sure people understand, an LMF is not a melting unit. Uh, you actually melt in either, you could melt in an induction furnace and then send it to an LMF or ladle metallurgy furnace, or you melt in an arc furnace and go to an LMF. And the reason that your inclusion content drops in an LMF is you're usually doing a couple things. One is you're just sitting there. And of course, the LMF's got some electrodes to reheat the steel, but just sitting there will help float out the largest inclusions. The other thing is typically, uh, LMF practice includes an uh, argon porous plug in the bottom of the ladle. And so you bubble the argon through to create a stirring action in the ladle. And that stirring action helps float inclusions up to the slag layer. And as long as you have a, fluid, a fairly fluid slag, it'll let, the inclusions will actually kind of get attached and, and end up in the slag. And so the whole idea of an LMF is to reheat the, the metal uh, versus the losses of a temperature you have, stir it. And then of course, there's also the added benefit is you can do your final trims. And because you don't have a lot of reoxidation going on because you're not blowing it, you can do your final deoxidation, put just the right amount of aluminum to achieve your uh, desired oxygen potential. You can do your final carbon and silicon, manganese, chrome additions because it's not an oxidizing situation. But I think the reason that you people will say LMFs make cleaner steel is because you, you're allowing things to sit, float, as well as accelerating that by using an argon stirring. I will say if you're going to argon stir and you have an LMF, make sure you don't get any bullseyes. That is, the steel doesn't get so vigorous it actually uh, starts kind of pushing away the slag layer and you see the physical steel. It's very bad. You'll actually see your inclusion content in that case uh, skyrocket because the steel start re-oxidizing. So that's a big key if you've got an LMF. Hopefully that answered that pretty well. Okay, the next question is, in cordless melting in, a, in furnaces less than one ton, how long at the end of the melt cycle do you recommend the power be shut off so the slag can float to the top of the bath for removal before pouring? 
<sighs> I guess I don't have a great recommendation. Um, I guess it would depend upon how quick you lose temp. In the smaller furnaces, and, and I'll take some of my practice, I actually tend to try to keep some pretty clean scrap. Um, I would probably wait no more than five because I'd be worried that you lose too much temperature before you need to tap. And you don't want to get this feel so hot that you can survive, I don't know, let's pick something like half an hour. Because if you're melting the steel and you get it hot enough to hold for half an hour with no power, well, first off, you probably ended up having to melt the refractory and get above, you know, I'm assuming for a second you've got a high alumina refractory, which will melt at about 3,200 Fahrenheit. If you get it hot enough where you can sit something on the order of, of that long, you'll you'll definitely melt the refractory and that molten refractory ends up as an inclusion inside your, your steel. Uh, that, that's also in general something to be careful of. If you look at your tap temperatures, make sure that you are uh, not at or above the melting temperature of your refractory because uh, if you see you're patching your refractory a lot, your refractory is melting and it's ending up as inclusions. So really on the induction furnace having things sit um, with no power, uh, that that kind of the competing things, getting things to flow, but not heat things so much, you're, you're really reoxidizing it. And that um, I would probably do something where maybe it's a low power, and again, I'd ha I'd have to look at the data and I guess what you really want, because uh, there are there were attempts to use an induction stirring, and there are a couple smaller steel mills that their LMF is actually not an, an arc furnace style LMF where they have electrodes, but they actually do use induction stirs and try to do a little bit of reheating with them. Uh, I'm not too familiar with people specifically trying to do that and, and hold, at least at this juncture. Hopefully that answers that for that gentleman or, or lady. Do we have another question? We do have one more. Okay. Um, would filtration with a ceramic filter effectively remove macro inclusions and oxides? It would. Uh, yeah. You know, if if the, and it depends on where you put the filter. It's kind of where I'm I'm hesitating. If the macro inclusions are formed during pouring, and this is actually one of the strategies that Foundry started using, is much more filtration. If you put it just at the down sprue, like there's quite a few designs in iron, aluminum, steel, in terms of, the, of where you apply the filter. It's going to primarily remove any macro inclusions you formed during the pouring and, and tumbling during the down entrance into the downspur. So it'll help with those. If for some reason the gaining system's not uh, laminar or it's a high other way to phrase it, if it, if it is a high turbulence gating system where you get a lot of turbulence after the filter, you still have an air atmosphere inside the mold and you're going to possibly generate more macro inclusions. So if you're going to put a filter at the bottom of the down sprue, you have to keep in mind that that's going to be removing macro inclusions generated during our pouring from the ladle into the down sprue. And we still need a pretty well-designed gating system to keep the fluid velocity down. Uh, the magic number I tend to use is you want an in-gate velocity about 0.5 meters per yeah 0.5 meters per second. Uh, that's based on the work of John Campbell and, and, a, and a host of work in aluminum uh, on gating design and, and the experiments that have been done and steel show that that magic number correlates. If instead you tend to gate, or sorry, put the filter at the gating, you're probably going to do a, probably could survive with a not as well-designed gating system. 
Uh, I'm still a little hesitant to that, just because if you have too many inclusions, you can plug the filter up, which doesn't happen too often. Uh, but that's the other strategy is put the filter right at the gate. The only thing is you have to make sure then you leave for the poor degating people enough room you can get a bandsaw or cutting torch in there. Um, and I know sometimes, depending upon the geometry of the part, that can be an issue. Okay, we got a few more questions in. Um, if you have time to to still address them. Sure. Where would you place filters for best performance? Hmm. Per, how I design, uh, and I've got a I've got a casting that I do my, those of you who are not familiar, my, my main research area is, is in the grain refinement of steel castings. And we have been using a filtered gating system. And I preferred to put it in the downsprow and then make sure I have a very laminar, low velocity, low turbulence uh, flow inside the runner and the gate to ensure that I not just prevent continued formation of macro inclusions, but also keep micro inclusions down uh, to try to get the best properties I can because I'm trying to do comparisons uh, from heat to heat. And that tends to be, in general, how I like to design them and how I instruct my students. I, I, I teach manufacturing processes and a metal casting course as well as here, and that's kind of how I still teach them is to put the filter in in the just underneath the downsprew and then design a very laminar system after that. The filter can actually really help you with that. And I've found that that tends to produce some of my best metal. And so that's my personal preference. Um, I have I will admit I've found gating systems uh, are like religion in the foundry industry. You don't consult anybody's and everybody thinks theirs is better. And so uh, maybe you pour, you know, I'm also an advocate and, and of doing some of your own experiments. Maybe you, you pour a simple little plate and, and experiment with having the uh, filter in one place or the other. Um, I, like I said, I, I tend to put it right in the, underneath the downsprew and design the whole rest of the system to be pretty low turbulence. And, and I do that and with some hand calculations and then using solidification simulation software. What's the next question? Because I don't want to hold people. Sure. Depending upon where we are, it's lunch. So I don't want to hold people up from that. All right. Well, the, the next question uh, it says, my understanding of filtration is that it is a surface tension driven system. Why isn't there a large sponge I can soak inclusions up in while it is in, in my induction furnace? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, if if I had, had found a large sponge, I'd certainly be happy. Um, your, under, your understanding of the, the service tension effects seem to dominate it, it is, is correct. But uh, how do I explain this correctly? OK, you, you, I'll do it this way. You still need the, the metal to flow through the filter. And you will stop an inclusion one of two ways. One is just physically it's larger than a pore, the pore size in the filter. The reason that you can get inclusions to, that are smaller than the pore size to be attracted to the filter is that because they're very small and they have a high surface area relative to their volume, they want to reduce that surface area between themselves and the liquid melt. And that's why they'll be attracted to the filter. Now, you're probably like, OK, thanks. That's what I knew. Go back to the sponge. And uh, so the reason a sponge approach wouldn't work is it's not the fact that you just dip it in and the inclusions are attracted in the entire melt. It, you know, they actually have to flow past the filter. I've never known anybody to try to mount a filter in maybe the side where, yeah, well, actually be the center 
uh, try to hold a filter in the center and get the stream to come up. Uh, I think there's some practical reasons that can't can't work, but you actually need the flow to go through the filter so that then the surface that the inclusion hopefully gets close to the filter to be attracted to the surface. Um, in theory, if, I suppose if you stuck a filter in and kind of turned it or turned it, you'd have to turn it pretty slowly so you didn't re-oxidize the metal at the top of the melt. You might get some inclusions to attach due to surface tension defect, uh, tension effects, but you wouldn't get all of them in the melt. The other, uh, there's a couple other sides to it. The other thing is since most of the filters we use are carbon containing for thermal shock resistance, you would end up, if you keep sticking a, a quote unquote sponge filter in, you probably have uh, carbon pickup, especially since you'd have to set it in the melt for a while. And that would probably be somewhat unpredictable and cause uh, consternation at the melt department. And then remember, even if I get them clean, you know, the melt perfectly clean in the furnace, right? If we have problems later on where we reoxidize them, we're going to end up reoxidizing the melt whether we like it or not, simply because we got to get the melt out of the furnace into a ladle and into a mold. And even if you do, uh, I know a company that makes uh, investment castings, they don't re-ladle actually. Um, they go right from the induction furnace into the mold, there's still going to be some reoxidation due to turbulence of that vertical fall. And you, you know, one thing that that you can use to help is using the filter in that case. So even if you could get a perfectly clean melt, we're still stuck with the, the reality that we're probably going to make the melt dirty at some point. Um, you know, I do follow the melt cleanliness work in the aluminum uh, part of our industry, and that's that's kind of where they're at. They understand a lot of this, but in terms of their reoxidation, and reoxidation aluminum is probably a much bigger deal than steel. Uh, we're lucky in steel; our oxides are lighter than our metal and will tend to float. Uh, their oxides are the same density as the liquid metal, so once it's formed, it's stuck in their mouth. They're really trying to stop all formation, and it's a real struggle to even if you they, they're Founders doing really great jobs at getting very clean metal and verifying that in the furnace, but they still have problems because of later on reoxidation issues. So hopefully that explains all the science and some of the uh, practical issues I'd see with with the sponge. But you know, hey, maybe I'll try to cook up some crazy way to do that. But I'm I'm not sure there's an easy way to do it. Maybe one more if there's one more. Yeah, there's one more. There's a few more, a uh, few more that maybe we can address uh, later on via email. Uh, but the last uh, live question we'll ask is: Would the AR stirring be effective for induction furnaces, or is it more effective for EAS? Okay. Um, if you're gonna, uh, it's effective for induction. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll just put it that way. It's gonna look different with the two those two different melting routes. There, there is, and I don't remember the company's name off the top of my head, there's a patented process where you can buy the plugs and essentially what you're doing is installing a argon stirring plug in the bottom of your induction furnace and plugging that into a argon source and you do need to run the argon during the melting uh, at least at a low flow rate to prevent the metal from getting in and into the, the pores of the porous plug. But you can run that during melting and you can even go into a low power state to help float out some of the inclusions in the induction furnace. So that's kind of how porous plugs argon stirring looks in induction. In the EAF, you don't typically put the porous plug in the furnace and and, and actually it comes back to an issue of how the two furnaces are built. Induction furnaces tend to be uh, relatively small diameters to their depths. So they tend to be much taller than they are wide. EAFs are designed the exact opposite. They're designed to be much wider than they are deep. And so if you're going to try to stir the melt, uh, if you were to stir the melt with an argon plug inside an EAF, you'd really only get recirculation in a, 
effective recirculation in one portion of the furnace and wouldn't be able to get an effective separation. So when you're argon, deciding you're going to argon stir in an EAF route, you really end up having to implement a ladle metallurgy furnace. And there are some difficulties due to the sizes of our typical tapping capacities and steel foundries for, for constructing furnaces that are effective. Uh, some of it's just physical constraints. If you're running only maybe a 40, 80 ton furnace uh, and the ladles are about that size, they're much smaller than the typical 150 to 200 ton size of a steel mill ladle. Uh, there's just things a lot more compact. You also have more heat loss, and those are reasons that we have not, in the steel foundry industry, really used a lot of LMFs. I know of people who are trying to implement them, and it sounds like they're being successful, but I, you know, I don't have a lot of the details of what they're doing. So again, I hope that answers things and, and helps you clarify how to be used in an induction route and an EAF route. And Shannon, if you, I guess you can email me the other questions, and I'll try to get those uh, responded and then hopefully sent out a get to everybody. We can talk about how to make that happen. Um, so we can get everybody's questions answered. Sounds good. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Tuttle, for uh, giving us this uh, very inf informational webinar. And thanks to all of our attendees for, for uh, tuning in and asking some great questions. Uh, be on the lookout for an email tomorrow with uh, the, the um, recording of uh, today's webinar. Take care. Have a good Thursday. Again, thank you, everyone.